Welcome to today's session, Commanding the Data Seas, Unleashing the Power of Analytics. This session is a level 100, and today you'll learn more about key topics such as data monetization, security, innovation, and literacy. It's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Uni and his panel of speakers. My name is Uni Pillai. I look after our financial services technology uh, practice in AWS here in Southeast Asia. And in uh, today's session, we will talk about data strategy, people, culture, and skills, and how business are being transformed with data. And uh, we have a panel of uh, speakers here who will be sharing their thoughts and their experiences with us. So without further ado, I'd like to quickly go through a round of introduction. My name is Santosh Mahendran. I'm the Chief Data Analytics Officer at Techcom Bank. A brief introduction of Techcom Bank in Vietnam. I'll give four numbers because this is an analytics uh, event. So 12,000 employees. We had a profit before tax of $1.2 billion. ROA is 3.2, if that makes sense to all of you. So 3.2 is a pretty good number that comes. Last but not least, we are the largest private bank in Vietnam. So that's what we do. Um, that's my job. So my job is as the chief data analytics officer is to make sense of all the numbers. I'm from Smart Hub. My name is Lawrence, Lawrence Lim. So Smart Hub is the analytics division of Star Hub. So uh, I assume StarHub doesn't need any introduction anymore, so, but uh, I think StarHub remains a, a best kept trade secret. Our responsibility in uh, StarHub span across four areas. So first thing is we work very closely with the commercial team and try to build analytics into every uh, differentiated value proposition for our customers as one. Second, we are also the team that support the data science and analytics projects within the company. Number three, uh, we have a little uh, team that runs uh, innovation, deep dive into innovation for AI ML. And number four, we maintain a partnership ecosystem uh, that consists of uh, channel partnership, solution partnership, as well as data exchange partnership. So that's pretty much what we do. I'm Hari. I head the data and engineering uh, division in, in income insurance. Uh, just to give you a background, income insurance, uh, we're the single largest uh, insurance in Singapore. We lead with all different kinds of products from life, general, and health insurance. Yeah, uh, NTUC Income was established in the 1970s as the only social cooperative insurance in Singapore. Fast forward 50 years, today we are a public non-listed company with its lifestyle-centric and data-driven approach to insurance. So we focus on building new products that's helping for the financial well-being of our customers with data as a centerpiece and being customer experience as a center point of driving the new product launches. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. So. Uh, the way I want to structure this conversation today is I want to cut it into three areas, right? Like, I want to talk about data strategy. So as an enterprise and as an, orga as a, as an organization that is looking at how do you use data, well, how do you build your strategy? How do you link it to the business values, right? How do you commercialize the data? And then how do you build the right culture and the people skills that are needed to actually drive value with the data? As we get started, uh, Santosh, I'd like to uh, start with you first. I know. Uh, Techcom Bank uh, started on its digital transformation journey close to three years back when you joined them, right? And uh, as a part of that, there has been a lot of changes that has happened in the bank in terms of like where it is going, how the strategy is being created. So I wanted to hear a bit more from you in terms of like, as a chief data and analytics officer, how did you build out the strategy, a forward-looking roadmap or a strategy of what are the data platforms that are going to build that are going to benefit the business in a very clear way? And then driving, and I will come to the people part later, but then how did you think about like how will I drive to the target state that I want to get to? Sure. So look, I think uh, every data strategy for any organization should be tied to the business strategy. I think so the key, the first fundamental point is understanding the business strategy. Um, and then the second is actually aligning your data strategy to that business strategy. So let me talk a little bit about Techcom Bank's story, right? So we, we, are a, we are a large bank, we have 11 million customers. 11 million is double, almost double the size of what DBS has today, right? And uh, as I told you, we've got 12,000 employees and it's pretty big in, that, in those aspects. The biggest challenge for us was we, we couldn't go down the value chain. And from value chain perspective, there are two big elements, right? One is the wholesale bank of it, the second is the retail bank, right? So when I joined, we had a close around 6 million customers. In three years, we have almost doubled the number of customers that we have acquired. And primarily, we have been able to do that through a digital and data-first strategy. Because obviously, you can't keep increasing the number of branches, right? So, so understanding the business strategy was one. 
The second is in wholesale bank and SME. Our focus was more on the upper SME and on the, on the big players. If you again wanted to go down the value chain, unless you had the right digital offering backed by the right analytic strategy, you would not be able to, you would not be able to go down the value chain. The first and most important is to align to the business strategy. The second is to understand what business wants. And the third is obviously to make sure your data and digital strategy is aligned to it. So one of the key things that actually went in our favor is that we had key strategy for our next five years, which was from 2020 to 2025, underpinned by three elements. The first was data, the second was digital, and the third was talent. So if you, if you take our annual book or if you look at all our annual reports, we continuously keep talking about this, data, digital, talent, and how this aligns to come together to form customer value propositions, which is in line with the business strategy. So data, digital, talent, customer value proposition and business strategy. That's what it is. Brilliant. Thanks for sharing that, Santosh. And I'll come back to you uh, in the next uh, section to talk more about the people and the, uh, sure. and the uh, skills part of it. Lawrence, I've got a, like, being a telco, you are, like, you have a lot of data with you, right? But then the other interesting part is you are the data highway, right? And, like, the channel through which, like, people communicate with each other and all of that. And the telecommunications industry, has uh, kind of evolved quite a bit in the last uh, decade or so. Like we have seen like IoT coming in, where pretty much every one of us wears some kind of a connected device or uses, uses a phone that is connected to the network. Uh, we've got 5G now coming up, where uh, not just for telco use cases, but then also for industrial and other use cases, we are seeing adoption, right? So I think it's, as a telco, it's not just about like creating a data strategy for yourself, but being part of the country's core infrastructure, you also have to like think bigger than your company's uh, like organization's data strategy. So I wanted to hear a bit more uh, from you in terms of like how did startup go about uh, with its data strategy and like what were some of the pillars that you were building on? First of all, I, I think, uh, I, I promise you I never pee bet Santosh answer, but somehow <laughs> it more or less would sound the same. So if I think about the few major changes, uh, or call it, we call it evolutions, that we incorporated into the data strategy recently, that I personally believe matters the most, uh, I would probably pick three to highlight. So, and that gives us uh, a lot of leverage in terms of creating value. So the first one was the fact that, uh, exactly like what Santos said, right? So ensure you tighten the connection between the data strategy and the business strategy. So how exactly do we do it? Actually, it started from the point when you're drafting the plan. So we have about 200 use cases in Starhub, and we actually scrub through all the use cases, tag a value to every use case, and eventually put them into big categories. So I won't tell you all the categories, trade secret. I'll just name a few. So one of them uh, sounds like this. Grow business with differentiation. And another bucket is uh, run business with efficiency. So if you look at your data strategy right at the top, actually it's all started from business. And this act as a North Star to guide every other components of a data strategy that follows so that the two pieces work as one and then to uh, focus on value creation. The second one would be the fact that we focus a lot more on uh, collaboration and experiments. So we make sure we give uh, the users the right tools in order to find the great work that's been done by other people so that they don't have to start from scratch all the time and they can stand on the shoulders of giants. So that's number two. The, number, the third one is what, what I call a, a transformation portfolio management. So which is necessary because now you encourage people to do more experiments, right? So with more experiments, we'll eventually have this difficulty. How do you differentiate between the great ideas from the good ideas? So you, nobody has unlimited resources, that's a fact, right? So uh, we, we have to make sure that we devote the best resources to the most highest value innovation. The rest is fine. Let them fail fast and learn fast and you still gain uh, insights from it, how to do it better the next time. So these are the three major evolution in our data strategy that I think is very important. Thank you for that, Lawrence. Uh, Hari, uh, over to you. Like, I mean, we heard from Santosh and Lawrence in terms of like, how they are structuring their uh, data strategy, right? Like, I wanted to hear more from you in terms of like, the insurance industry in general has gone through a lot of changes in the recent past, right? Like, similar to banking, where they have seen like digital banks and neo banks coming and disrupting the core business, we have seen like uh, insure tech and like completely digital native insurance companies coming and disrupting the traditional insurance business. That has driven to a lot of uh, innovation in the insurance industry where we are now seeing like devices being connected to uh, collect information in terms of like how cars are driving around, how safely they are driving around, 
like linking health applications to uh, uh, to your medical insurance premiums and like driving right behavior from the customers and making sure that they're healthy and all of that, right? So I know there's a lot of part about like driving a data strategy for your business, but then also about like how do you uh, like have a link with the community as well, right? So I wanted to hear more about uh, more that more that from your standpoint, like how as an insurance company you're looking at it and what is income doing specifically about it? I think a great question, but I want to take the lead from Santosh, right? Because I think what he said initially is common across any company that's doing a data-driven strategy, yeah. right? Because you ha the first and most important is how do you ensure your business objective is aligned to your data strategy? Mm -hmm. Because your business objectives is the one that's setting the direction for your business strategies, right? So you want to ensure, for example, today it could be your you want to improve your customer experience, you want to improve operational efficiency, you want to improve or reduce cost optimization, right? Then this kind of leads into your data strategy, tells what kind of data you want to collect. And now once you identify what kind of data you want to collect, and from there on you look at the data quality that you want, then how do you want to pick up where, and where are these data residing, and what is how accurate it is, right? And then we went to look on to see how do we do a data infrastructure around it. As you rightly said, the bank started off first, the insurance companies picked it up from there, right? And we start building our data infrastructure platforms that can hold these data so we can harness and give the right insights to the business community. And once now you have the business insights, right, then you need to have a data-driven culture. Because once you don't have the culture in, even though the tech teams and the data scientists can give you all the insights, it's no way to consume it. So you want to ensure that the culture is kind of built onto it, right? And again, once we have these four things going, you still, again, need to keep revisiting all your strategies, right? Because your business objective change over a period of time. Yeah. In the last few years, we've seen the environments change, your business objectives directly change proportionally to it, right? And then you have to realign your data objectives and your data strategy along with it. So that's what we've gone through the last two years. But I would say the core of the whole thing is to make sure that you have your senior management right from your board, your CXOs to support it and be the champions for a data-driven decision making, right? Once you start championing it, it becomes top down, everybody kind of gets aligned to the strategy and it starts moving. So very key insight for me there is like executive sponsorship, right? Like ensuring that you have the right level of executive sponsorship from your leadership and ensuring that like, as Santosh also mentioned, that they're like anchoring and like embedding it into people's mind that those are the three or four anchors that your organization is standing on, like that is what is driving the next stage of growth for your business, right? So, and someone told me like, follow the money. Right, and mm -hmm. that is where data monetization comes in and data commercialization comes in. So the way, uh, like, the, what we want to like talk about next is, like, how do we use data and like start thinking about like how do we drive innovation with that data mm -hmm. and start thinking about how do you commercialize mm -hmm. uh, that data. So Santosh, like, I want to hear some examples from your side, and you have been in the business for a good part of more than two decades now, right? So mm -hmm. you have seen this over and over happening again and like, at different stages of mm -hmm. how data and analytics have evolved. So I just want to like get mm -hmm. some insights from you in terms of like. What are some of the key things that like, folks who have come here to attend this session today should take back as kind of like these are the principles on which we will be building our data monetization and data commercialization strategy? As you rightly said, I've, been, I've seen this data journey for quite some time. And what I've seen it evolve is that there is a lot more focus on the offensive use cases than the defensive use cases. Mm -hmm. Historically, data has been seen as an asset. People have always seen it. It's good to have. And then people said, OK, let me generate some MIS or reports or dashboards. And I'm, it's great. I've already monetized my data. But that's no more the case, because data is business. So generating a MIS dashboard or report, unfortunately, the bad news is that's, that's, that's passe. So if anyone is here in the business of doing that, that'll disappear soon, too. So, but, but the reality is, I think, um, how do you start measuring value out of data? How do you actually monetize data? And how do you truly generate value for clients? Right? I think these are the three most important questions you need to answer. I'm, I'm not going to sit here to list down the process, but what, what I can talk about is, let me talk about a couple of use cases, because data is going to become, is becoming pervasive. So it's just not one particular vertical in an organization or industry that's going to get affected. Right? Now, with the advent of large language models, generative AI, all these and with neural networks coming all much more easier to be accessed, which was not in the domain of easy data scientists before because it was much controlled. We are going to see more and more changes coming in. So a couple that we in Techcom Bank have pioneered, the first, I'll talk about an offensive one and I'll talk about defensive one. Sure. An offensive one that we spoke about is we reduced our time to S 
a credit underwriting process from weeks to hours. So from weeks, we are able to bring it down to hours. Obviously using data, obviously using automation, we had to change some of our processes, but it was purely also driven by the fact that we could understand our clients better and we needed far less data to say yes to clients, where the process was also. This is just not a data-driven change, but this also involves digitization, process change, driven, underpinned by data. That's one. Second is anti-money laundering, right? With, again, with the advent of data, you have good characters and bad characters. So the bad characters are becoming smart, so the good characters need to become even smarter. So that's also something that we are trying to push forward on that. So anti-money laundering is a very good defensive use case where we, have, where we are pioneering new techniques and to make sure data can be used properly. And credit underwriting is something that we're doing to make sure that we can serve customers better. Well, that's a great example, Satosh. Thanks for uh, sharing that. Lawrence, moving over to you, I know like with telcos, it's always been a bit tricky when uh, the topic of data monetization comes in, right? Like because you're dealing with people's real data, right? Like, like where they are, what they're doing, and stuff like that, right? So you have to strike a very good balance on data governance, security, the ethics of it, and all of that, right? Like, I just want to like, like hear from you some like guiding principles and also like some stuff on like what you have been doing in startup about data monetization, and if you can share something that is not extremely confidential. Uh, in startup, we use a very simplified uh, framework. So we call it the CCE framework. So the first C stands for compliance, meaning uh, things that is non-negotiable. You have to do it 100%. So these things refers to like PDPA regulations, uh, PII protection, data security, and also uh, making sure you check the right checkbox and you get the right opt-ins to use the right information in the right way. So all this comes under the first C. The second C uh, refers to control. So it refers to stuff like uh, role-based access control, who can see what, which part of the data table is supposed to be masked and all that. Uh, and we also have this thing quite important called the definition control for use cases. So every use cases, case by case, you have to look at the insights you are giving. What is that definition? If it is too small, some part of the insight is too small, and there is a danger of someone identifying someone, uh, then you have to do data suppression. You have to cut it all away. So if that part doesn't get cut away because it's necessary to tell certain stories, then you probably have to expand the picture and make it less defined. So we do this uh, methodically for every use cases that we deploy. So the third one, uh, which, is, which is a bit of a tricky one, uh, E stands for ethics because it's in the gray area. So people usually assume that once I've cleared the first C and the second C, that means I can do everything I want, right? So not true. So whatever you can do doesn't mean that it's always right. So uh, that's why we created another checkbox, put in all the different processes and guidelines to say, no matter what, you have to check the last checkbox before you roll out your projects. Yeah, so uh, it's relatively easier for us to do because in telco, most of our staff get a free phone line and a very heavily subsidized line, right? So. You can imagine all the data scientists and analysts while well, they are running around and playing around with the data, right? They know their data is inside the same data pool. So I'm quite sure that will keep them more ethical over time. As a startup customer, I'm happy about that. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that, Lawrence. So uh, Hari, uh, over to you. Like a very similar thing, right? Like we've seen that there's like a lot changed in the, insur in the, in the insurance industry overall and then like things are becoming more digital. Uh, like my personal experience of like dealing with insurance companies have gone, is, has become much better over the last couple of years with all the automation and like workflows that are kind of being uh, uh, made simpler, right? So I wanted to like hear your thoughts in terms of like how do you see some of like like how do you see data commercialization and like if you can like share some couple of examples in terms of what you have driven in income. I mean, uh, insurance industry in general has a large volume of data, right? I mean, traditionally we collect a lot of data, but we don't use much of it. Yeah, I think the last few years, thanks to technology, I think most of the insurance companies in the region have started using AI and ML. They started using it to analyze the data, understand the pattern and customer preferences, right? Once they've understood this, this is where they're able to curate better products for the customer and also find the right fit for them. And what this is giving the insurance industry is we are better able to optimize the pricing by understanding the risk of different customer categories that we have, right? So once we understand these points, which comes out of your data insights, now we're able to build innovative products. I'll just take an example, right? In Singapore, we are the leading motor insurance. But even though being a leading motor insurance, when you look at the customer preferences that's coming in, there are people who use the car just only on the weekends. And they're like, why should I pay an annual premium, right? 
If I just use it two days a week, if I'm a person like Santosh who's traveling in and out, then I use it once a month and it'll be even lesser, right? So then that's the kind of preferences that people started asking us, right? So then we said, okay, then we started looking at usage-based insurance. So motor insurance is based on usage. Whenever you use it, it's more flexible. You can charge or pay even your premiums based on the number of kilometers you travel, right? So that's the kind of products that we started to build. Then we also started, by the insights, we want to reach out to more digital channels, right? Like rightly, like when he said, we are more a paper-based industry traditionally, now we want to reach out to more digital channels, get the customer engaged, right? So that's why we started building more lifestyle-based products and insurance. I think in income, what we're doing is called Tribe, which is more like a lifestyle-based insurance, right? You can decide your premium. Today, all of us are used to being playing a flat premium every year, right? It probably increases or stays stagnant there. But based on our lifestyle, our life events changes, we want to also adjust our premiums accordingly. So we got that change based on the data insights that we did. Similarly, we did a financial planning app. So most of us today, like me, would have traveled via MRT to reach the venue, right? So whenever you check in, tap out of your MRT station, you can attach it to an insurance or an investment product. You contribute a few cents, a few dollars, and that's how you start building a financial portfolio, right? So these are the few changes that the industry is going on. I think in general, the insurance industry is evolving. They're getting to be above the curve, learning to use data modernization and all the digital channels across. And that's very interesting, Hari, because like, I think that the last one that you gave was very, was, was very cool, right? Because you are like, doing like, transactions that are like few, few, uh, few dollars, but then you contribute like, micro amounts into something yeah. that becomes like a, hopefully like dollar average and like, become a yeah. big corporate. At end of the year when you time. see it's a huge yeah. money that you've collected. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty awesome. So I know like all three of you are very passionate about people and skills and all three of you mentioned it as a part of your data strategy thing and, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with you Santosh again. It was a big change in Techcom Bank, right? Like it was, AWS has been working with Techcom Bank for a couple of years now and we have seen that change uh, and the journey uh, and we have been very happy to be the partners uh, working along with you. But then tell us more about like how, did you, how do you even like get that change embedded into the company's DNA, mm. right? Like, I think you spoke about like embedding those uh, values and like uh, and using those three anchors mm. about digital data and uh, talent. The, the talent and like using that to drive the thing, right? But then it doesn't change the behavior. You can do it on the technology team. You can do it on the back office teams. Mm. How do you drive the right behavior on the front office side? Like people who are like customer facing or people that you don't have a direct influence over. Right? Like how do you drive that and like get the, like drive it through ex uh, executive sponsorship within the organization? Culture change is probably the biggest, biggest bottleneck to any transformation, right? It's just not data or uh, digital transformation. Uh, one way to overcome culture change is, as we rightly said towards the end, is executive sponsorship. Is it coming from the top and leaders role model that behavior? So when we start off on our journey, we made it clear the management team will come together and live what we are trying to preach. So meaning to say, we started undergoing trainings on how we actually want to move away from Excel. So today when we run our management uh, meetings at, at the bank level, we, we were running purely based on sheets and sheets of Excel. Now we try to do it interactive on an interactive basis. Okay. So uh, we are not fully there in full transparency, but most of our reports are automated now. So we use Power BI, which is running on top of our data lake, and we use, try to use as much real-time information as possible. So we stop, stop people printing papers, because that was a big thing. So people used to bring a lot of Excel, sit in the management meeting, keep debating those. So culture needs to start from the top. So we have done that, and we said, as much as possible, come prepared for meetings without any, any paper. That's one. Second, a lot of the 15-member management team, all of us, we started attending trainings wherever we felt, where we had to hone our skills, because we wanted to show that example, and as a result, out of 12,000 employees, you would know that close to 8,000 employees are now AWS certified. Now, whether it is front end or whether it is back end or whether it doesn't matter what role you are in the bank, everyone knows what the strategy of the bank is. Everyone knows you need to upskill and everyone is signing up for it. So I just gave you two simple examples where we are changing our behavior yeah. from starting with the management team. So every meeting that we go to or I go to also, I avoid paper and this thing, Excel. I say, show me, show me, show me the data directly, show it on where, wherever it is. Mm. And then if it's not automated, then we start challenging. Why is it not automated? And driving those questions is actually changing the culture. It is slow, but it is, we are able to see an impact. That is pretty awesome, Santosh. And I love the part where you spoke about like 
8,000 8, people being certified on AWS. That is amazing, right? Like that is, that's really raising the bar on uh, talent transformation as well. So that was like similar question to you, like how did, how like startup has been in, in the business for a while now, right? Like how have you uh, guys thought about the culture and like how uh, data is being used in the organization or how did you bring the change to the existing people that are there? I think it's very easy to just go out there, hire a bunch of uh, new people and then change the organization. But then I think it's more difficult to change it with the existing people and bring that cultural change in them. So can you talk a bit more about that? I think, I think most organizations right now wanted to uh, chase after this thing called data-centric culture. So I'm just thinking, what should happen before data-centric culture comes about? Actually, in my opinion, it is this thing called data curiosity. So how do you invoke data curiosity? Actually, in my opinion, it came from this thing called innovation cultures. And I thought about this uh, statement that was said by some smart man, uh, very important when you're trying to build culture in a company. He said, how failure is being perceived determines how success will be attempted. So if everybody that tested on something think that they have to be 100% right all the time, if not, they get scolded, they get penalized, then your innovation culture is not going to grow. So what, what do we do uh, other than making sure that we build the right culture that eventually leads to a uh, data-centric culture? We put in tools to make sure that uh, people, like, like I said earlier, they stand on the shoulders of giants. They learn from each other. Don't start everything from scratch. That's very important. And the second thing is we actually set up forums and platforms. Uh, we call it TEDx Smart Hub. So for all those people who have done a great job in creating value, uh, they think their project is really very innovative, they spend about 10 minutes telling the rest of the companies what they have done. And after that, we give them access to the models that they've built. So it can be data models and machine learning features and machine learning models. So that, that's just how we cook up the entire uh, culture. Thank you, Lawrence. Hari, a similar one for you, but I'm going to... Uh spin it a little bit. I think we are all talking about like using data to drive uh, innovation and drive, uh, drive decisions and all of that, right? But then there's a big factor of when we talk dealing with people, it's about their intuition, their experience, and all of that, right? Like how do, how is income looking at like blending both of those and like how do you actually enhance the human superpowers, but then also use data to drive uh, the acceleration of that? I mean, uh very interesting and realistic question. Right? I get boxed between my business community and my data science community every day because who's making the right thing, right? Probably I want to take a step back and see the strengths and limitations of each approach, right? If you're taking a data-driven thing, it kind of gives you a lot of insights. It gives you a lot of trend that probably a normal human wouldn't be able to identify. But similarly, it might not give you the full picture or the full story, right? On the other hand, if you look at a uh, end user, they would give you the full context and insight what the data might not be able to tell you. So in an insurance industry, this nuance is very important because especially when you're dealing with life, health, and medical kind of claims, right? So the context is very important. And so when you look at this, and we look at what is the problem statement that we're trying to solve, right? So we don't go into this solution approach. We look at what problem we're trying to solve. For example, if I want to find out and predict which are the customers most likely to make a claim, then for this, a data-driven approach is much benefit, right? It's more appropriate one. But at the same time, you want to see which are the claims that are fraudulent, right? Then it's more efficient to get a user to look at it, right, from our intuitive thinking. And so when you start at a use case evaluation, you look at the problem statement. Okay. And then we look at a hybrid approach. When I say a hybrid approach, we use the data platform, we use the data models to get all the insights, provide the insights to the business community, why we have the respective stakeholders, domain expertise, looking at these valuable insights they make the business decisions with the context behind it, right? So that's how why we start off. And as the model starts getting mature, we're trying to build a culture which is more collaborative in nature, and there's a transparency between the data science community and the business community. And then we try to kind of have a picture where there's a feedback loop from the business community. As the models mature, the feedback loop is very important, right? It kind of tells you whether the outcome, the insights that you're getting from your models, is it very relevant to the business? Is it aligned to your business goals or not? Once this starts happening, then I think that's why you strike a right balance between data-driven and uh, human intuitive thinking, right? Yeah. I think that's the right balance that we want to achieve, too. Totally makes sense, Hari, and thanks for sharing those insights. Yeah. So uh, with that, we are, uh, the time's up, and I, first of all, want to thank three of you for joining the panel and sharing these valuable insights, and I'm sure that the delegates who attended here uh, learned quite a bit. And I really hope that you, as leaders and uh, data professionals and analyst professionals or people who want to get into that space 
like really got some valuable insights from here and like best practices in terms of like how these organizations are looking at their data strategy and how they are building their talent and then ultimately converting data to money and basically following the money, right? So thank you very much again for, uh, for all of you for joining us for the session. Please stay back for the next session uh, where we are actually getting into more technical details of some of the things that these gentlemen spoke about and, discuss, and, and discussing how it is actually done uh, on the ground, right? So thank you very much again, Santosh, Lawrence, and Hari for joining, us, me, uh, joining me on this panel. And I really appreciate you being here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Very much.